guys, it's Wendy Sod again here at the Sodcast. Thank you for joining me today for another great case. Um, the case I have for you today is that of Janine Brown. She was 19 years old, uh, lived in a village uh, called White House in Ohio. Uh, there, Janine lived with a couple of friends, her friend Pam and Pam's brother Larry. Um, on November 17, 1983, the night of the incident, um, Pam and Janine decided to go up to the local bar to play a game of pool. And along with them came uh, Harold Eastup, who was Janine's boyfriend at the time. Also went by the nickname of Crazy Horse. Um, so they get up to the bar and they're having a good time. And Pam states that there was another gentleman up there that she knew of by the name of Andrew Gustafson. Now this kid was 26 years old and he was a known rich kid in town. Uh, his family um, owned a business and did very well for themselves and he was just kind of arrogant they said and kind of flaunted the fact that his family had money and whatnot. And, um, I guess Pam said that he was making some statements about Janine that evening that, you know, she had a cute butt and he just was kind of focused on her. But at the time she didn't think too much about it. And as the evening went on, um, all of a sudden Janine came up to Pam and she seemed like she was upset and she just said she wanted to leave. So Pam and Janine head back to their apartment, and when they get back there, they get in their PJs, and um, Pam, and so Pam starts talking to her about what's wrong and what upset her at the bar, and she tells Pam that she's seen Harold kissing the barmaid. Um, so they talk about it for a little while, and Janine just cannot shake it. She's upset. She wants to confront Harold and the barmaid about this kiss. So Janine gets dressed and she decides um, about 3.30 a.m. that she is going to walk back to the bar and confront Harold. So she leaves the house and um, it turns out that Janine never arrived back at the bar that evening. So... On November 19th, approximately a day and a half later, a lady was out for a walk and noticed along the side of the trail she was walking on that there was a large amount of blood. And in the back of her mind, she's thinking, there's so much blood, somebody must have slaughtered a deer. And so she goes walking over and she notices a pair of black panties laying on the ground. And then um, as she gets closer, she notices a foot with a sock on it sticking out of the ground. So immediately she panics and she calls police and police and the crime scene unit uh, respond to the crime scene and they begin to collect evidence. So items that they found at the scene, um, they found a pack of Merritt brand cigarettes that did not belong to Janine. Uh, they found the black panties, amongst other articles of clothing of Janine's. Um, upon uh, excavating the body, uh, these investigators are hit with a, just a gruesome sight. Um, they said that her body was uh, severely beaten, uh, covered in welts. Uh, the medical examiner would say that these welts uh, appeared to come from a belt buckle. Um, her throat had been slit from ear to ear, almost completely decapitating her. And, I mean, it was just a horrific, horrific sight. Um, so they immediately um, begin to question people that were known to be at the bar that night. Um, they talked to Pam, they talked to Larry, um, they also talked to Andrew Gustafson. Now, initially, Andrew says that, you know, he doesn't know her, he doesn't recognize who she is when shown a picture, and he then later says that 
well, yeah, I know her, but not that well. And he just, you know, changing his story already. And he's just very suspicious. And they, um, they don't have any evidence to really make any arrests at that time. So the case um, kind of stalls for a while. And they um, finally they get a phone call from a co-worker of Janine's that worked with her at a local nursing home in White House. And this co-worker tells them that on the night of the incident, November 17th, they seen Janine getting into a van at approximately 4 a.m. with a gentleman. And she wasn't forced to get in the van. She appeared to be calm and was having a conversation with him and got into the van willingly. And um, this was huge for them because as they looked further, they discovered that Gustafsson owned a van very similar to the description that this coworker gave. So at that time, they bring um, him back in for questioning. And um, he clams up. He's not talking. He gets this high-powered lawyer, um, probably that daddy's money paid for. And um, he's just not saying anything. So um, they did get a search warrant to search the van. And in the van, um, they did not find any blood whatsoever. They did find a pack of Merritt brand cigarettes. And um, thank God they were smart enough to collect the cigarette butts from the van. Because this would be very important later on. So at the time, um, they still didn't have enough to arrest him. They couldn't prove anything. Um, so years go by. And in 2013, uh, the police finally decide to um, reanalyze this DNA that they have. They had obtained some DNA from the cigarette butt along with the rape kit and other things from the scene. So the DNA on one of the cigarette butts that was found in Gustafson's van was linked back to Janine. So now they knew that for sure he had had her in the van at some point. So they um, continue to push him and he's just not talking. And um, finally, um, they try to get DNA from him willingly and he flat out refuses. Uh, but luckily enough, um, they already had his DNA on file. So six years prior to this, uh, Gustafson was involved in another sexual assault case where at that time he willingly gave his DNA. So they had it on file. So the DNA that they had collected, um, they had already tested against uh, some other people such as uh, the barmaid. Um, they um, tested it against Larry who had since passed away um, but they still were able to get his DNA and rule him out, who was Pam's brother. They tested against Harold Estep, crazy horse, and ruled him out. Um, the only one left was Mr. Gustafson. So, they finally tested against him, and it was a match. Thank you, Jesus. Finally, after 30 years of being a cold case, they got this SOB. And he, he is just still in denial. He's not admitting to anything. Um, his lawyer uh, puts in for a plea deal. And actually, the family of Janine agrees to this plea deal because more important to them is they wanted to know what happened and they wanted a confession from this jerk. So with that agreement, um, he was on December 14th of 2013. Um, 
he did get sentenced, but he only got 10 years for the crime um, with this plea deal. So he uh, is sitting in prison and he is eligible for parole in 2028, uh, which is only a few years away. Um, God help us all if he gets out. Um, you know, and I, I would not be surprised if down the road they connect him to some other cases because the brutality of this and what he did to Janine, it just does not sound like a one and done. I mean, it just blows me away, the brutality of this case. So that is the case of Janine Brown. And we are so happy that finally her family got some justice, even though it took 30 years. Um, hopefully he doesn't get paroled. And um, all we can do is keep praying that he stays behind bars to keep everybody else out in this world safe. Because I think he's a monster. Um, okay, guys, that is the conclusion of today's case. And thank you for joining me. And I will see you on the next episode. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.